I'm Steve Vibronix, and this is the Life in Dub podcast, talking to people who live their lives in dub and reggae. Episode number 25. Welcome to the 25th episode of the Life in Dub podcast. How are you all doing? I hope you're all okay out there. Thanks for listening. I hope you've been enjoying these life story interviews. There's now pretty much 24 hours worth, so don't forget to check back at the list of previous shows wherever you get your podcasts, or go to the Life in Dub website, lifeindub.com, to pick up any of the Life in Dub stories you might have missed out on. If you want to get in touch, got something to say about the podcast, or any suggestions for guests, anything like that, just email me, vibronix at gmail.com. Thanks to all the listeners that are telling people about Life in Dub and helping share the podcast on your channels. It's really helpful, so thanks again. This week, I want to talk a bit about Searching for Jar, the latest Scoops Gold Disc classic release that came out last week. Thanks to all the people that rushed out to buy a copy before they all sold out. They all went in less than 24 hours. And it's always great to see that people still love this track. For sure, it's one of my favourites. We first met Michael Prophet in Sardinia, of all places, when we were both playing at a music festival there maybe 10 years ago. Prophet was funny and full of life, but also friendly and not at all standoffish or high and mighty, especially considering he was actually headlining the festival. He'd been living in London for a long time, so after Sardinia we kept bumping into him at dances and events in London and other places, and eventually we fixed the date to record. And I remember when he arrived at the Conscious Sound studio in Hackney, trying to find somewhere to put his precious leather trench coat that he was wearing, because even off stage, he liked to look his best. I'd asked him before he came to the studio if he wanted to write to a particular rhythm, but he told me he was happier just seeing what happened on the day. And from the first few bars of that track that I played him, he was on it. He didn't want to hear any other tracks, and he clearly had a head full of lyrics. For him, this was the one. And for me, as a fan of Michael Prophet's voice, right back to those early songs with the Roots Radix band recorded in Jamaica, you can't really explain what it's like to hear that voice on one of your tracks. And it went on to be one of the most loved productions I've been involved in so far. So thanks to you, Michael Prophet. Gone way too soon, but what a musical legacy you left behind for us all to enjoy. This week, my guest is Earl Gateshead. Many of you will have caught Earl's infectious reggae selections over the years, whether with the Trojan Sound System, Reggae Roast, or any of the other many sessions that he's played at. We have a really interesting chat about how different things were back in the old days when reggae was brand new, and also about how Earl helped get reggae music into music festivals. Anyway, enough of me, let's get on with the interview. So, Earl Gateshead, welcome to the Life in Dub podcast. Well, thanks for inviting me, Steve. Bless you. Everyone who listens to the show knows that I always start off with the same question, um, just to kind of kickstart things, which is always to ask the guest if they want to name like a song that's been really important, really influential, maybe a turning point, something you look back and think, yeah, that song really kind of changed things for me. So I was wondering if you've, uh, you want to tell us about a song like that, Earl? Well, I... Uh... Yeah, that's quite it. I mean, from I, I always liked ska, like everybody, like kids, like babies. I always liked ska. The move to reggae uh, was, uh, I think, the Max, the first Max Romeo, the Max Romeo album, Warner Babylon, mm-hmm. and the tune One Step Forward. At the time, I very much identified it, and it was nothing like anything you would get in any other kind of music. And uh, I loved it, and I, I played it. I played the whole that first side of the album. If anybody who's listening, Warner Babylon, the first side of that album by Max Romeo, probably the best side of reggae you're ever going to hear. Lee Perry production, of course. And but he just reached me with that uh, one step forward, one step forward, two steps backward in a Babylon. I heard it when I was working in a job, and uh, you, you heard it when it came out, did you? I, I'm not certain when it came out. Pretty close to when it came out. Uh, uh-huh. Definitely, I don't know, I heard it in about, I don't know, 1979, 80. Probably came out in about 78, I would have thought. But yeah, when it first came out, yeah, def- it, it, it was massive for me. Uh, One Step Forward's a, a, just a fantastic track of... of uh, it's you know it's magical. It is magical. Yeah, I, I agree. I totally agree. It's it's amazing. Yeah, and it's an anthem that stood the test of time. It's it's forever music. The other two would be I, I know it's corny, but fifty four four six. That's another song that would only be in reggae. The the man's talking about when he was in jail, 
and he says, somebody else is in jail now. Somebody else has got my number. I had 5446. Somebody else has got 5446 now in jail. And uh, that is a, a, a reggae attitude, a, a, uh-huh. a sort of an, an acknowledgement that we're all the same and that all our problems are the same and that we're, we're a human race. It's all contained in that uh in that song, I think. And someone who's no longer with us as well. Yeah, of course, love Toots. I met Toots and I love him, yeah. Yeah, he's no longer with us. Uh, but he, he's left a body of work that's never going to be forgotten. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And you, you say you've got another track as well. I mean, I'm asking for one, but three, three's good. Oh, my God, Natty Rebel. You, Roy, and Lee Perry and Bob Marley. You can't really beat that as a combination. <laughs> uh, Natty Rebel, I'm a... I, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I just love that tune. See the morning sun ah, on the hillside. I'm a living man. I've got work to do. I love that. Great. I think you're the first person on the podcast, Earl, to sing out the song that's inspired them. So obviously Lester left a really good impression. So it's, it's great to hear that. But what what I'm trying to do with the podcast is trying to kind of just get um, a bit of a kind of understanding of the, of the person like that I'm interviewing and their sort of story and kind of where they're coming from. So, um, so you um, you're down in London, but you're not sounding like a Londoner to me. No, I'm a Geordie, born in Gateshead. That's where I got my name from. Uh, I'm, I was born in Gateshead in an entirely white urban background. <laughs> Uh, and I heard reggae quite late. I I, uh, I I was born and you know I never met anybody black till I came to London when I was twenty three or so. I never met a black man, and uh, but I was t- I was already interested in ska and had ska records. Uh, but uh, no, I'm I'm, I'm a, I come from a very white northern background. And like earlier on, you mentioned like. Um... This, like, you always love Scar, but when it comes to reggae, th- these are the songs. So to put some kind of time perspective on it, I mean, and as someone who's um, one of the elders of the podcast I've interviewed so far, is w- 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 do you remember the transition from, like, Scar to reggae? Is that something you kind of witnessed? or? Um, yeah, I suppose I did. But as I say, I was, I'm, I'm quite conservative in some ways, and I was right into Scar and had no, and didn't have so much. It, it took me a while to feel reggae, actually. Um, I don't know, it was in the 70s sometimes. I I, uh, I started to feel it, as I say, with Max Romeo and Gregory Isaacs as well. I, I just started, and of course, Bob Marley. Um, no, at first I didn't like it much. I've got to tell the truth, I didn't really like reggae. It was a bit slow, and I found it slow and a bit plodding, like non-reggae people do. Uh, I mean, even now, I sympathise with people when I play them at Deep Roots and they think, oh, it's slow, it's bloody. Because I did feel like that when I first heard it. It it just, it, but it, I absorbed it. And I, as, as, as everything, as you begin to understand it, then uh, you begin to appreciate it and you begin to like it. It's also, it's always, it's always got this kind of slow, fast thing for me as well. It's like, what amazed me was hearing what I considered slow tunes played on a sound. And you'd see people like kind of skanking, kind of double time, and the whole thing comes alive when it's played at like volume. Stuff that at home is maybe a bit more like armchair, but maybe when you play it out, has got more of a kind of you know the, the rhythm comes alive even for a slow track. I I, I always found. What do you mean that with the slowest tunes? Yeah, yeah. When you play them out on a sound system, whatever, they can really kind of come to life. Yeah, you have to hear them loud. It's true. Then you get the texture, the sound. Which is, and, and also the the emotion, you don't need, I mean, now I feel you don't need fast music. You don't need it to be fast to get your point over. And you can make your point, uh, if you make your point slowly, it's in, in a more relaxed way. I don't know. I, 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 um, I mean, it moves as well. I mean, uh, sometimes I like music to be quick. It's some, you know, for five-year periods. And then another five, in the next five years, I'll, I'll rather have it slow. Uh, you know, it, it, music is a reflection of how the world is, and your your it's synthesized through your sensibility, and um, you know it you, you, that'll leave you either wanting wanting it fast or slow, happy or sad or whatever. 
it, it, it's a reflection of the state of the world, how you see the world. Well, when you say like state of world, what what? How would you say the state of the world was when you moved to London when you were a lot younger? Because it must have been quite a different place, I guess. It was much harder. People don't realise how tough it was. I mean, it was hard times anyway, but we were used to hard times. When I think about it, it was just post-war, really. And I mean, if, it, if we had times like that now, people would be moaning because there was nothing, really. London was a bit of a shithole. There wasn't very much going on. It was dirty and dark, and um, it was a lot of violence. It was a very violent place. I saw a lot of violence when I went out at night. Um, and uh, people beating each other up and stabbing each other and glassing each other seemed to be quite common. And uh, there was a big gap between the races, much further than it is now. In general, it's been a big improvement <laughs> from I mean, just generally in life. I think that people don't, don't want to hear it. They all want to believe. I don't know. It seems to me like a lot of people want to think the place is getting worse. But I think the whole world's got better, actually. And certainly London has, and certainly the UK has. I, I do remember when I was a kid, like loads more, like sort of low level violence between people, which I put down to like boredom and stuff. It's like, you know, at least people are distracted now with stuff to do. Yeah, the culture's changed though as well. I mean, you used to get, I mean, they, they changed, you, you've got to understand the reflection, the way the media reflects. Uh, the way the media influences people. You get films, in the films in the old days, the goody, if he didn't like somebody, would punch him in the face, you know, or whatever. But you don't get that now. They don't do that. John, you know, John Wayne was, oh, he's such a hero, he punched somebody in the chin and whatever, you know. Um, but if you look at the old films, they're always punching each other. But the new films, they don't. They shoot mm -hmm. each other. <laughs> but they don't actually <laughs> punch each other. You know, so I think culturally people have, act, you know, the, the, the people who determine the direction of our media thing have decided, you know, to not show mm -hmm. so much personal violence and that's affected people. People are affected by the media. And what about what about reggae? Like, you know, when you were younger and you, you started to discover it, I mean, what, what kind of stuff was going around in London at, at the time? Do you, do you have any recollections of that kind of stuff? Uh, well, I first started going to... I, I listened to sound systems and, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know the tunes then. I knew all my ska tunes, but I didn't know the reggae tunes. Um, but I, I was at the sound and I remember Echo Mine at Sweet Dreams, the Eurythmics tune, and uh, I remember that, hearing that on a sound and loving it. Uh, but I don't particularly like it now. Uh, you know, your sensibility changes. And you say a sound, I mean, I, again, I, I, this is where I can't start sounding like a stuck record because I, I always dig into these questions, but, like, what what were the dances like? I mean, where, where were they? What, what, what kind of thing was going on there? Well, there was two sets of dances. I mean, I came from a white world, as I say, uh, and I came down, I, I built my... I saw Black Sound Systems and I built my own... I didn't even know I was building a sound system, to tell you the truth. I just saw what, what the black people, what the Jamaicans had, loved it, and built one. I didn't really... I, wouldn't, I didn't even call it a sound system, to tell you the truth. I just built these massive speakers and uh, crossed it over three ways, had my tweeters, my mid-range and my bass, and I just set it up. And in essence, when I set it up, I was playing for white people. And uh, they didn't know they were listening to a sound system either. Did you have a name for your sound system then? Oh, just EG Sound, EG for Earl Gates. I didn't really call it anything. I, I, I just, if they played, I'd just take my sound along. Uh, I, it wasn't, no, I didn't really have a name. But then I joined another sound. Uh, I set up my sound and a guy called Marky Lyric, who... Uh, came down and he'd started building this sound. This kid, I'd set it up in a place called the Dive Bar in Soho. And uh, I was, you know, in this super cool um, Soho basement with my sound system. So Soho basement, that's like a small underground thing in Soho. And Soho at the time must have been quite a place, I guess. It was very different, again, massively different. It was all prostitutes and rent boys and uh, 
peep shows and uh, late night drinking, illegal drinking places. It it was a different world completely. Because things, a lot of places used to close early and this sort of late night culture, which we have now and take for granted, the younger generation, it's kind of just wasn't really around then unless you were in these places like Soho, I guess. You had to pay money to go into a nightclub. Nightclubs were horrible. So you'd walk up some stairs into some drinking place and, uh, you know, there'd be music on and, uh, you know, you could drink all night if you want. And uh, I used to go there. It, it was a, a sort of... I mean, I, I'd come from quite a stable background and it was all prostitutes, like I say, and, um, and people, the girls from the peep shows were, all, were there and... You know, we drink all night. It was an eye opener for me, and I, I definitely learned learned a lot in my early days in Soho about just about just not not judging people for what they do and how they behave and how they make their living. And what what were these nights like with the uh, with the EG sound system then in Soho? I mean, what 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 was it like? Fantastic, absolutely incredible. Still, probably my best DJ experiences. I mean, I started off, I didn't just play reggae, I'd play anything, actually. I started off, I remember the first time I set my sound up there, I thought, oh, starters, you mean to go on? I'm in the middle of Soho, it's white, and actually the bar I set up in was a gay bar. It, I mean, I, as I went on, it became straight or mixed, at least. But when I started, the whole audience was gay, and I started playing reggae, and I, except for my friends, of course. And... Uh, I started playing reggae, which generally doesn't mix with gay people. Uh, a lot at that time, it didn't anyway. And, uh, but I thought, no, I'm going to play. This is my music, and I'm playing it, like it, I love it. And actually, the, they liked it. They were all right with it. And gradually, the clientele changed, actually, as the years went on. And I got started getting hit people instead of, uh, you know, the, pe- the people who just hung around in Soho for whatever reason. <laughs> and you hear these sort of stories about Soho and it seems to be a hub for a lot of other people and scenes. And did you kind of encounter any other people at the time around, around no- in those days? Well, I mean, yeah, I met everybody, really. And everybody, met, I mean, uh, everybody that was around. Uh, uh, it was the time of the Wag Club, actually. The Wag Club was the coolest place in the world. And the White Club Club was just down the road from uh, um, where I uh, where I uh, played in Soho, and everybody from the White Club used to come into my place first, and then go to the White Club. My place is called the Dive Bar, and uh, it was underground. And uh, yeah, I mean, I remember Jerry Damas coming in for one. But really, the the crowd was sort of semi hip, and there was a hip crowd, and there was a sort of Soho, I don't know, Soho denizen crowd. People who just lived in Soho because you could do what you wanted in Soho at that time, mm-hmm. and it was a sort of mixture. Yeah. But the nights would really take off. I would, uh, I play a lot of. I mean, I'd play p- things like Curtis Mayfield, Curtis Mayfield. But when I started, I'd play Irish music and everything. But as as the night went on, I, I'd uh, I'd play harder and heavier, and uh, I'd play a lot of roots. I'd play a lot of roots, you know. And I give myself a bit of credit for. Sp- uh, I tell you, who used to come in, the soul jazz lot. Soul jazz was this, you know the soul jazz lot. That was the shop yeah. was just around the corner, and they didn't know any reggae at the time. I'm talking about you wouldn't get a reggae record in any of the record shops in Soho. There's about ten record shops. You wouldn't even the second hand shops didn't have a reggae section. You, if you wanted reggae records, you had to go to a specialist reggae shop in Brixton or Dalston or somewhere. There wasn't even a reggae section. And I guess you were quite a buyer of records as well. Um, um, is that right to say? Well, that that came on slowly. I mean, I was too skint at first. I just played what I had, and then gradually, as I got money, I, I bought more and more. But it was very, you know, it was hard to buy. It was hard to buy tunes, really. I mean, I, you know, I, I started doing a bit better about 20 years ago, and then I really started investing. When I earned money, I put it straight back in and bought records. And uh, really my big-time buying, expensive records, started about 20 years ago when I started mm-hmm. to uh, 
do a bit better because for the first 20 years, I was absolutely skint. I mean, skint. It was, like I say, it was a different world. You used to keep a roll of money in your pocket. Like, you'd have a, you didn't, I didn't have a bank account. I'd have a roll of money in my pocket and that roll would get bigger and little. And sometimes there'd be bills coming in and the roll was getting little. And... Did you have an elastic band around it? Yeah, that, that was it. That was my bank. And uh, uh, that it was that way for, honestly, for maybe 20 years. That roll was, when I was doing well, the roll would be big. And other times there'd be a big panic on because I couldn't... Well, London's London's such... Because, you know, I, I come from the east of England in like a little town and now I live in Leicester and Leicester's always been quite a cheap place to live but London has always been the kind of place that just saps your money as well. You need money to live there. Yeah, I mean, you need money full full stop. I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't, I was living rough, i got to say, at that time I'd left work and I'd decided I was never going to do a straight job. It was the 80s, I mean, that time was the 80s, you see. you got to put these things in context. And Mrs Thatcher, it was the big turnaround from you know, a, a sort of liberal attitude. And Mrs Thatcher came in in about 79, I think. And all her attitudes became strong. You know, we had the face and it was about style and mm-hmm. expensive and, you know, dressing up. But I was never into that. And I always thought it was crap. And I always thought the music was crap as well, which is partly the reason I set up my sound as a reflection of how shit the music was in the 80s. <laughs> and the music that they were calling good was, in fact, crap. And all of them, a lot of the music that was uh, called great in the 80s because it had style was, in fact, didn't have any substance and it was crap. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to play r- real heartfelt music. And uh, so I was playing soul, jazz and reggae, really. And how, how did it kind of progress from there? Because, I mean, I know that you took the leap and started working with Trojan at some point. And what, what kind of... How, how did it... Because I guess you got more successful at it and got better known and whatever and got more into it. It was... But Bob Jones brought me in, really. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Bob Jones. He's a soul and jazz DJ. And I was booking... Uh, what happened was... A guy started a nightclub called Sav Ramsey in South East London, and my friend knew him, and uh, he, he asked me if I would go along and advise him or talk to him. And I went along, and I ended up doing his booking for the nightclub, and he had, uh, you know, I had to book an act seven nights a week. It was a mad old gig. Seven nights a week, that's crazy. And I had, I, I went and got, I mean, I, I sort of ate the sort of, uh, Kiss FM booking at the time. I booked a lot of their DJs. I booked Giles Peterson and Norman Jay and uh, Galliano and people like that. But I also booked Bob Jones, who was their Manda. And Bob, uh, I got on really well with Bob. Bob was probably the first, he was maybe the first specialist DJ in the world. And he inspired millions of people and he inspired me. And uh, the owner of that club, the, it, the neighbours got the club, it was called the Red Eye Club. The neighbours got it closed down and the owner, Sav... Well, I guess if it's seven, seven nights a week, it's going to drive everyone nuts, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I, I'm still bitter about it, I tell you the truth, because we'd only just got it going. It, you know, we went about 18 months and he lost a load of money and then... We turned it around and it started to be full and he started to make money and then they closed the stone, which is a lesson in life generally. Anything you're unsuccessful at, you can do forever. <laughs> but if you're successful, people will try and bring you down. And there was queues outside the door and people don't like that. And uh, we got closed eventually by the council. But Sav, uh, we used to go to the Blue Note uh, on a Monday night to hear Norman J. Norman J. ran a a famous Monday night club at a club called the Blue Note in Hoxton. And everybody used to go. It was a a fun Mm -hmm. club. And uh, we used to go then. I used to take Sav, who was the owner of the uh, Red Eye. And uh, we got to know the Blue Note. And then Eddie Pillar took it over. And Sav became manager. And uh, he brought me in. And I got a... uh, The Blue Note became the hippest club in the entire world. And I started playing reggae there. And uh, I got confidence, actually, because every top DJ in the world played there. And what, what kind of time was this? Because I, I do remember the Blue Note being around. 
96, mm-hmm. uh, something like that. that. Right. Uh, I, I was all, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, and at the, I became confident at the Blue Note. Before that, I just thought I was a pub DJ, really, and I was just playing in bars. I knew I, I could, you know, I, I never compared myself, I never th- put myself on any sort of chain of DJ, and I just went to Diet Vibe Bar and played my thing, and... And then when I played at the uh, Blue Note, I started to uh, realise that, you know, I, I was quite good at it, really, and uh, what I did, people liked. And I, I became more more confident. And I got to say that, you know, the first place that booked me, biggest respect to them, Fabric booked me <laughs> when I was playing at the dive bar. Fabric, like the kind of sort of rave club or whatever. Yeah, when they opened it, yeah, they they, book, they started booking me straight away. I was a pub DJ, for God's sake. And uh, they put me on there, and that, that was a big thing as well. I mean, and when I played there, it went really well. And uh, that was a sort of a, 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 a turning point. But the big turning point was probably... Uh, I used to go to Plastic People all the time on Oxford Street, and I knew Addy who owns Plastic People, who's probably the single most influential, influential person in British music, really, Adi Fakili. Uh, he's responsible for so much, and he never gets a mention anywhere. But he um, he ran a club in Oxford called Plastic People. He moved into Hoxton, and he asked me to run a reggae night. And, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I would have just played reggae and got my mates in and whatever, you know. But Adi was, like, very ambitious. He said, no, get the top people in. And I said, how can I get the top people in? You know, you've only got a tiny little club. He said, just ring them and ask them. <laughs> and uh, so I did. And I got people like Big Youth and Bobby Digital, Alt Nellis. And what, what, what was the name of this club? I just called it uh, Reggae Fridays. I mean, it was it's a legendary club. Uh, it was legendary. You had a fantastic sound system, Adi. And uh, so I played with all those people and that was me moving into the overground mm-hmm. sort of reggae world because I got on really well with all of them. Big Youth in particular became my friend. I got on really well with Sugar Miner. I didn't just get on well with them. I found a, a real sympathy with them. I mean, you know, I felt similar. You know what I mean? It wasn't just, oh, we understood each other. They, I felt what was odd, they understood me. And mm-hmm. I understood them. I, I can't explain it any better than that. But when I'm not just saying I got on or we shared jokes. We understood each other's point of view and we understood each other as pers- people and why we performed and why we made art and why we were involved in music. I understood that we're about big we youth and sugar. And We were lucky to hang out with those people because, you know, like we were talking about Toots earlier on, you know, a lot of these people you're talking about aren't around anymore. So it's kind of, you know, amazing to be able to share a bit of time with these people. Definitely. And it's the humanity that's there. Alt Nellis, you know, he was just... I mean, I'll tell you what I did describe. All those people that got to the top in reggae, they weren't any of the mugs. They were all super sharp, intelligent, aware people. All of them clever on by any on any scale mm-hmm. the uh you know those people sugar was like that uh, alton ellis was like that and of course big youth who's a very clever bloke uh i, I began to re- you know i realized that as well it wasn't an accident they didn't they weren't discovered or anything and got lucky i had a break they were just super clever people who were uh able to uh, channel their feelings. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of people don't realise that how kind of, if you want a career in it, just like you say, the people I've met who've been really successful, it's like they're really on it. They know what they want to do and kind of they're not scared of doing it. And it's not like some happy accident. They're really talented and the music industry finds them. It's like they get involved and kind of make their way in it as well. It seems to me a really important part of it. That is it. They they pull the levers because they're clever. You know, they understand the whole... I learned a load of them, particularly Big Youth, who I went touring with. And Dr. Ali Mantado I toured with too. But I learned a load of Big Youth. So was this the kind of connection with, with Trojan? Was was this kind of going on at this time? Because that's, that's kind of how I guess I remember when I first heard about Earl Gateshead was the Trojan sound system. 
I'm seeing that like everywhere. At that time, you you got to put things in context. All this, the sound systems that I'd grown up with, the performance based sound systems, had uh, sort of died out, and the dominant sound sound method of doing sound coming from Jamaica was people mixing tunes. There would be versions, and people would endlessly mix them, mix all these versions, and play like 30 juggling. seconds, mix into the next one, and they called that sound system, and I was furious. I just thought it was crap. I started my sound system again. I wanted to start a new performance-based, old-style sound system, you know, where about you played the record, you played the version, your performance played on the version, you played another record, you played the version, your performance played on it, that sort of basis that was based around live performance. I was furious that it wasn't happening then. And were you, were you picking up the mic then as well? Because obviously you're known as someone, you know, who's like happy to, to chat away on the mic. And were, were, you, were you always doing that? No, uh, that's, uh, that's when I started doing it. That's when I began at that point. I had to really. Starting DJing was a reaction to how crap the music was in the 80s. It, you know, the style. It was about style. It was the style decade. It's, it, it was crap. I mean, AG Sound was just me playing records on my sound system. But I wanted to start a big sound system. And uh, that, that, was, that was a result of being dissatisfied with what was happening f- coming from Jamaica, mm-hmm. this mixing, mixing versions. I, I'd, I'd learned a bit, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd move, as I moved through life. And I wanted a partner. I, want, I wanted a partner, and I wanted a partner who could probably do business better than me because I'm crap at business. And so I got my friend, I had a friend, Daddy Ad, who I DJed with occasionally. And uh, Daddy Ad, uh, he ran a big company. He was a proper businessman. Uh-huh. He ran a, a, a couple of magazines called Sleaze Nation and another one. And he was a proper businessman, did proper business things, but he knew reggae. And uh, so I thought, oh, I'll ask him, he'd be my partner. And... Uh, I asked him and we partnered and we got Brother Culture in as our first MC. And uh, me, Daddy Ads, Brother Culture and a couple of other guys. Uh, um, and uh, we started performing as Roots and Reality. That was our name, Roots and Reality. And we were doing live performance and uh, doing this old time sound system thing, which nobody mm-hmm. else was doing. And I was putting the singers right out at the front as well. I was, I was uh, keeping the decks at the back of the stage mm-hmm. and running the singers across the front like a performance thing. And, uh, absolutely nobody was doing it. And um, what well, Daddy Ads at that time started working with Trojan. Trojan had asked him to do some business work and connected with a magazine or whatever. And, uh, and then they said, they knew about our sound and they said, did we want to, would we? It was weird, actually. They said, would we be Trojan Sound System for a couple of gigs for them? Because Trojan's one of the biggest names that, especially people like new to reggae, it's kind of there at the front in the kind of record shop and whatever, and it's like they're the kind of doorway in for a lot of people into reggae, I think. Yeah, Trojan were massive, but I didn't feel that. I didn't care about them, to tell you the truth, because I was, I don't know, I was playing singles. I don't know, I didn't really, I wasn't that bothered. And when... When they asked us, I said, no, <laughs> I didn't want to do it. Because uh, I was Roots and Reality and I was completely committed. I wanted to do Roots and Reality and I didn't want to get involved with the big world. I didn't want to get involved with the record company. I still had my anti-Babylon feelings from the 80s, from Thatcher and all that. And I didn't really want to deal with those people. And uh, But it, I was persuaded Daddy Ads really wanted to do it. We did a couple of gigs and... Uh, they went so well, like you see, I couldn't believe it because it was just roots and reality. Uh, but we called ourselves Trojan, and uh, same performance and everything, and we got massively yeah popular very quickly. But I I also knew that reggae was good. I had a I had a plan as well at that time as well. You got to put it in context. You'd never see reggae at festivals. You'd never see sound systems at festivals. Yeah, festivals were like rock music and maybe folk music and then dance music. But yeah, reggae was, it took a while for that to kind of... They were frightened of reggae. They are frightened of black people, really, the people who ran it, and frightened of Jamaicans. They didn't understand it. 
I knew that reggae should be there at all the festivals. It had a place in the spectrum of it. It deserved to be heard. And I, I very much wanted to uh, to move reggae, to basically make space for everybody. I knew as soon as if we got in, everybody else would come in behind. After a while, they'd book everybody else and reggae would move through. I did that consciously. And, and we did. It was our mission, really, to bring reggae to the overground. And what was it like working with um, with, with Trojan at the start? Because obviously, you know, they are like well known and kind of, I guess, you know, you could say like a commercial kind of thing. And like, um, and h- how was it working with them? I, I was banned from going in the offices after this. <laughs> you were banned from the office. Yeah, they didn't. Want, they wouldn't let me go in. <laughs> It was. I mean, I mean, they had a point of view which I just didn't understand at all. Uh, I had no experience of it. I didn't really understand regular company politics or attitudes. Around. So in the end, they, they made me stop going in, um, and I didn't go in their office for about five years. Really, is that because they were busy working and you were like kind of hanging out? No, because I'd argue <laughs> with them and I'd tell them what they were doing wrong. <laughs> I'd argue with them constantly. I'd, t- I'd say what I thought all the time. I had no... You know, you're supposed to guard your tongue in, a, in a, those political business situations. But for me, it was music. It was a creative thing. And there's no point guarding your tongue. You say what you think in all creative situations. Otherwise, they don't <laughs> work. And uh, you have to be honest in all creative things. And, uh, but they they kept you on as they like. Well, no, yeah, they, well, yeah. Well, we did so well for them, <laughs> Gordon Bennett. We did fantastically well for them. Because I definitely remember. I say, like I said, uh, you know, earlier on, I, I remember seeing that combination. Earl Gates said Trojan Sound System. It it seemed to be really successful. It was massively successful. We played everywhere, yeah. And we did break barriers everywhere. Uh-huh. And we did change it. Everybody else started performing the same way as us. You know, having uh, having live MCs and uh, about performance-based sound system. Everybody did it. Nobody did it when we started. And also, the other thing that we intended to do to get reggae into the overground, that worked. Mm-hmm. Um you know, all the festivals started... They started booking us, and then after us, Channel One came up scurrying through. And then our shanty eye and all those people in our trail, and good luck to them. I, I, that's what I hoped would happen, and that's what happened. And did, did you have some kind of expectation to play stuff from the Trojan back catalogue? Because obviously they've got a, have got a brilliant back catalogue. I mean, there's no two ways about it. No, that was a problem, uh, definitely... Uh, less of a problem now. I'm, I'm more willing to do it now, weirdly, uh, even though I'm not with Trojan. But I, I, it was a problem, really, because he'd get all these skinheads, people turning up. Now I wanted to play contemporary reggae at that time, or Roots, and I didn't particularly want to play ska. But as it happens, I've turned back to ska a bit now. I like ska now. But I was right off ska at that time, and I only really wanted to hear Roots and uh, mm-hmm. Roots and Dub. At the, uh, and I started, you know, in heavy dub. And I even played dubstep. When dubstep came along, I played a bit of dubstep and drum and bass. And I didn't I didn't want to be a museum. I wanted it to be contemporary. Uh, I, for me, it had to be con- it had to be relevant, not a not a museum, not a memory. It had to be a now thing. And mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, we did come into conflict with the Trojan people. But they didn't feel strongly enough to to make an issue of it. And did it start to take you, like, you know, I guess you're not playing in Soho in a kind of dingy basement anymore. It's like it, it took you far and wide, did it? I mean, how, how far did it take you, the, the Trojan thing? Well, I went all right. I, I'd already started travelling even before tr- Trojan because I started travelling with Big Youth. Uh, Big Youth, uh, I was selector for Big Youth, and we used to we used to go places, and I, with Cody Ranks as well, and Dr. Ali Mantano, even before Trojan. But uh, with Trojan, yeah, we start. It was endless, really endless, really on the road a lot. All of the festivals, all summer, really, really, really four or five gigs a week, and often nice. abroad and uh, abroad, you know, three or four times a month. And then, you know, 10 gigs in England, 10 in London. It was, uh, 
it was a, a very hectic time. And, uh, and that's you and Brother Culture. Cu- with Culture and, of course, the, the great Superfall, who doesn't get... Who's the blind MC. I don't know if you saw Trojan. Superfall's blind. Fantastic lyricist. Chucky, okay. Chucky Banton, a brilliant singer. Mm-hmm. And uh, we are, I got on ever so well with him. Brother Culture, I love him and respect him, but, you know, he's not permanent in any situation and he went his own way um the the core of trojan was super four who mc chucky banton a really sweet singer and Jar buck who had a sort of rough rough voice daddy adds on the music and the sound system and me on the mic and sort of general mc thing and selecting and we were a strong team and we could rock any party in any situation. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were good, man. We still are. I mean, if we did it now, it would be good. They, they were, everybody knew that job inside out. We, we were doing 200 gigs a year, you know, so we were slick. Yeah, yeah. You, when you're doing it that often, then you, you, yeah, you, 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 the tea, it's like military precision, isn't it? We had harmonies. We used to rehearse. That's what made us different than everybody else. We'd rehearse every week and we'd work out harmonies. So in the vocal, in the freestyle things, we'd have harmonies worked out. Everybody would be singing in four-part harmony. Um, so we had a, those those kind of things which nobody else had. So. Um, but mainly, we did, we achieved our aims. Ultimately, we broke we broke through for reggae. People don't understand when we started. Mm-hmm. You'd never get a reggae act in a festival. Now all of the festivals got a big reggae thing, and all of the general festivals. And uh, we 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 had a we went a long way towards you, you that. You think you kind of helped show people like. This is how you can present reggae. The audience was already there, really. We showed the book as they needn't be frightened. That's what it boiled down. They didn't know a way into it, like so many people were reggae. But I was very interested in the performance aspect because it's it's the people's music. And I loved it that anybody could get up and get on the microphone and, you know... And, yeah, that uh, interaction, it's not like I'm going to stand here and like passively watch someone do their thing it's that kind of like we're in it together that's what I've always loved about it definitely it's like kind of feeling a welcome yes and that was so different from the rock thing at the time where you had to stand and you know adore these glorious people on stage it was a complete contrast to that so, so what what did you move on to doing then after Trojan what, what was the kind of next thing for you after that well just playing on my own really God, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've never stopped DJing. I, I just DJ a lot, and I've always DJed a lot. I just don't DJ with uh, Trojan anymore. I, I, you know, I'd had enough. Um, so yeah, I felt I felt I wanted to be. I felt I wanted to be free, and uh, I, you know, it's quite restricted when you're working to a schedule as well. You know, if Trojan had one gig, I had to be there for it, and uh, I just I. I uh, I just, I don't know. I I started, I started working as Earl Gates said, basically. But uh, I've always moved around a lot and been willing to mm-hmm. adapt and change. And um, one of the things I'm proudest of, actually, is being the first. I was the first reggae DJ to play at uh, Fabric, first reggae DJ to play at the Ministry of Sound, first reggae DJ to play at all the big clubs in Ibiza, you know, I played at Space and all their big clubs. And uh, even at the dive bar, where I was for 23 years, I think I crossed reggae over a lot. I've, I've, I've worked for reggae because I believe in it, to tell you the truth. I do believe in reggae. I think it's better than the other forms. You know, I, I play all the other forms of music. I've played every kind of music. i played house and drum and bass and dubstep and funk and jazz. And they're all great in that way, but reggae is different and reggae is better because it's a third world form and it's a genuine voice. It's a genuine people's voice. It's a voice for people, whereas none of the other forms are. So your love of reggae is kind of never wavered then from, you know, right back to the start of like, you know, one step forward and... Yeah, exactly. It's still, it's still, I still play one step forward. It's a voice. It's got something to say. Virtually most reggae tunes have got a point and a reason you know, 
the guy is saying something. He, he's talking about something. There's a, and I, I like the point of view it came from as well. Uh, so I promoted reggae all the way through, and I'm still promoting reggae, really. Well, it's kind of interesting for me because it's like, you know, you're a little bit older than me. I'm beginning to get a bit older, you know, as we all are. And how, how is it being like an elder in the in the music world kind of, like to be well when we could perform but to be performing and playing because it's like there are a lot of young people at the sessions i don't feel like an elder people treat me like an elder and uh, i don't know how i feel about that either <laughs> but because uh, i mean in music the rea- i mean you I, I, I only really look forward i i understand what's happened beforehand and no i know the context of things like i say i know the context of the music in the 80s, the context of Roots music. I was there. I under I understand the context it came from, the heart it came from. But I only ever really look forward. I don't really look back that much. I mean, people treat me like an elder, and that, which is a characteristic, because it's a third world culture, reggae is a third world culture, and in the third world, older people are given respect, which I like, and should always be the case, but I don't particularly, I don't particularly feel it. I want it. <laughs> and would you say? I mean, you know, you're a bit of an ambassador for reggae these days because you seem to travel a lot. Well, when we could travel, travel a lot and go to sort of far off places to play music. Is that I, this is going to sound usually big headed? But I did. Uh, I did have a lot to do with reggae crossing over in the UK, crossing over to the mainstream. And I feel like mm. it's sort of done now. And I can go to other places and still do that work, cross, uh, cross, explain to the general population the value of reggae music and how they can appreciate it as soon as they understand the language and as soon as they work out the, the, the spiritual direction it comes from and that it's a third world music. And they're used to hearing first world music, but if they hear a third world thing and uh, understand a third world perspective, it'll make them bigger as people. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I, I, I like to do that, and I'm doing it in India now. Well, it's a big, populous country, isn't it? I mean, I played there. I mean, I I, I think we met at the Goa Festival a few years ago. I remember, I remember seeing you there, and we were talking and whatever. And I'd done a few shows there. That was my first time playing in India. And um, I had, had a great time. Obviously, in Goa, it's quite an international kind of festival. And to, did you get a chance to play to kind of maybe a more regular Indian crowd when you were there? Yeah, the crowds are 50 50. It's not, uh, I mean, you, you'll get 50% white people, Europeans, and South Americans, and uh, the other 50% Indian. But it won't it, in the crowds. But, the, you know, the crowd, the Indian percentages are getting bigger and bigger. And more and more people are building sound systems. More and more people are getting into it. It just needs a, a little nudge now, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it'll cross over in the main. Uh, but it, I'd like to the crossover the right way. Well, the, the other thing I'm sort of interested in, and we mentioned it at the beginning, is obviously you have your own podcast where you interview people. I have my own podcast where I interview people. Hence us doing this. And I was wondering why, um, how you went about starting your podcast, and why why that happened, and what 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 made you do that? I enjoy uh, I enjoy listening to podcasts actually, and because uh, there aren't many like reggae and roots and sound system and dub podcasts. They don't. That's why I started doing this one. The reggae world's still a mysterious world for a lot of people, and uh, it's just a way of helping to explain it and bring people in, and. Uh, yeah, it's just a yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help explain uh, the reggae world to the outside world, which has been my mission from day one, really. And how's the how's the feedback been? You know, people people listen to them and, and like them, and uh, I've never had any negative feedback, and I've had a lot of positive feedback, and so have the artists. I mean, because it's funny, like you say about wanting to. In, you know, to bring people into reggae and to let people know about it and stuff, and that's that's totally what I'm all about, and I've always tried to do that. Um, but I think the podcast, my podcast, is generally listened to by people who are already really into it and just want to find out more about it, which is great. And it's kind of 
but because they're sort of quite I think once you get into these deep interviews and people who aren't into the thing aren't as interested as people that are into the thing and it's kind of whereas you know I, I do think that there's people outside the reggae world who'll be interested in these stories because you know I've interviewed all these people that have got amazing things to talk about and um but it's uh yeah it's just how do you break out of that you know the kind of hardcore of people uh, uh, none of the current reggae records could ever cross over into the charts we're ghettoized uh, in my opinion we're making too much music directly for sound system reggae's music is for everything you know if it could be played on the radio or whatever you know reggae should be everywhere it's not just sound system music and uh I think we've let ourselves get a bit ghettoized, actually, in my opinion. And uh, we need to break out of that ghetto because reggae is for everybody. Unless the sound system becomes something which is absolutely everywhere. <laughs> and that's the other chance. <laughs> that's what I'm rooting for. Yeah, and that would be great. I mean, I did hope that, you know. I mean, sound systems are, you know, there's more and more and more and more of them. I mean, God knows what's going to happen post-COVID, but... There's more and more and more uh, sound systems. And that, it is the best way of listening. I love to play on them. And I love, li- you know, if there's sound system playing anywhere, I'll go and listen. But uh, there's more to reggae than that as well. And uh, it should be for everybody. You shouldn't, you shouldn't need a sound system to appreciate the tune. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, when I'm mixing, that's always, you know, the sound system's definitely my background. From, you know, I make music for sound system. But I totally want it to be able to transfer to headphones car whatever you know play at home and enjoy it's kind of you know it's music uh, foremost that's the way it should be and uh, but I, I do feel like uh, it, uh, at the moment the current scene is a bit ghetto well we've been talking a while now so um i was wondering what kind of things we can expect from you sort of moving forward obviously for someone who's a primarily a dj out in the field it's really tough times at the moment. Really tough times. I'm 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 building up a new. I mean, I'm I've always liked to communicate. I'm a communicator, a, a facilitator. Uh, you know, I'm a a mensch, a person who puts people together, and uh, I'm going to do that under under all circumstances. And at the moment, I'm building up. Mm-hmm. A, a, I'm going to try and perform from my house and put it live on the YouTube. And uh, and see what happens. I'm just I'm putting as much music out there as I can. I don't know about you, Steve. Endlessly traveling isn't the best thing in the world. Not the overnight traveling. No, it's it's funny because I love traveling, and it's kind of it's it's like such a bonus of like the world getting into like roots reggae and sound system so much more. Is it's taken me literally right around the world in the last ten years, especially, and. You know, traveling is also kind of a hobby. I mean, I do it, you know, as something I I just enjoy getting out and about, especially places that are a long way away and to kind of going somewhere really different. I I love all that. But you're right, I don't miss the the, the bad side of traveling, queuing up when you're exhausted at another shitty airport and kind of endlessly moving around it's kind of that's that's hard it's hard work i don't miss doing that you've had an hour sleep you just lay on the bed in the hotel for an hour and that's all you got and then you come back and two days you know you, you, you're two days at home recovering and uh, i don't really particularly miss that if i do gigs now i want to if i'm going to go somewhere anyway even before this covid thing i want to stay a week you know and uh, enjoy the place and do my gig I know these overnight gigs where you, you turn up late in the afternoon, you go to the hotel, you put your bag down, you, you go straight to the venue, you do a sound check, you play your show, you get up at six o'clock in the morning afterwards, haven't gone to bed at five, and you get a plane. I don't, I, I don't miss that. No, it's hardcore. It's hardcore, definitely. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I must admit, I'm, 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 I'm up for the current challenge. It's a challenge at the moment to communicate. <laughs> I, and I'm saying it's a challenge and I'm up for it. I'm ready for it. Well, what, one thing I'm sort of asking people at the end of each interview as well, which a question I ask every guest, is um, my book of dub question. So I, I write everyone's name in the book of dub, the book of dub, and I wonder what people would want written next to their name, just something to be associated with them, with their life's work, with their life in reggae and dub. So if I write Earl Gateshead 
in the Book of Dub, what what would you want written next to it? Dreams can come true. Nice. I mean, it's a, especially in the current climate where you know, people are, a lot of people are very desperate, I think, at the moment for obvious and, you know, good reason. But the passion for music doesn't go away and the, the desire to listen to it and also to make new music, it's like, you know, that's an unstoppable force. I, I don't know. I, I, I do feel this current situation is a challenge. It's a challenge for everybody. It's, yeah, you know, sure. for, for some people, it's, you know, the whole thing, wait, wait, where are you going to get your dinner is a challenge. How are you going to pay the rent? It's going to be a challenge increasingly. It looks that way anyway. But for us, for us, it's a challenge to keep doing what we do and find new ways of doing it. Um, nice, nice. Well, it's a nice sentiment to to leave it. So I just want to say, Earl, thanks for taking part in the uh, Life and Dub podcast. It's been really interesting hearing your perspective on stuff. Well, th- thanks very much for giving me an opportunity to express myself. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks for joining me and Earl for this 25th episode of the Life in Dub podcast. Make sure you're always up to date with the latest episode by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. And if you enjoy the podcast, please tell people about it and help share it and help get these stories to more people. All the info you'll need about the show is at the website lifeindub.com and I'll see you all again in two weeks for the next Life in Dub podcast.